you. So, first of all, it's really a pleasure to be here, a, a, a great honor, a great pleasure. I want to try and share with you a little bit about what I think of as soft matter physics. I want to tell you about the science that I do, which is what I really love. I want to tell you about the technology, which I also enjoy, but I see that as a way of uh, giving back to society who supported my research for so long. And I also want to tell you how the science leads into teaching, which is what we're supposed to do as professors. Um, but this is a unique way of doing pedagogy that we uh, came up with uh, recently using science, uh, among other things, uh, to teach. So what are, what are soft materials? Here's examples of soft materials. Uh, there are common materials that you're used to around you, the foam on the uh, uh, beer that you're going to drink tonight, uh, paste that you use for toothbrush, foams, gels, emulsions. Cells are soft material, tissue is soft material, even you are soft material. And if you don't believe me, pinch yourself. And you may believe me, but it'll certainly wake you up. Um, this is a real example of some of the things that we study. This is what Brown must have seen when he looked for Brownian motion in a microscope. This is actually very uniform, solid particles, about a micron in diameter, uh, diffusing in water and visualized with a confocal microscope, a, a way of really looking very precisely at the motion of these particles. And we use this, we study the motion of the particles. Here's an example, these are individual particles. We can track their positions over, over time. This is how they move in time. This is one axis, the y-axis. This is the position as a function of time. And we can analyze this to learn a great deal about the nature of the motion of the particles, the Brownian motion of the particles. This is the mean square displacement, the average distance that the particles move after a certain time lag. What more commonly we do is co uh, uh, concentrate the particles. Here's an example. This is not a computer simulation, but rather is real data looking at the motion of concentrated particles. And this is a way that we can study something like a glass. This is, in fact, a supercooled fluid. It's a fluid that wants to become a solid, that wants to become a glass. And if we look at the uh, motion of the particles, you see that the fact that it's a fluid means that the particles have to move large amounts. And this is the way that particles move large amounts. They don't move individually as large amounts, but they move collectively. So there's large clusters of particles that move. You can think of this as one particle moving. Literally, there's room for the other particles to move behind them. And you can measure the length scale of this, and you can learn something about the glass transition. In fact, here you see that the length scale of these motions get larger and larger as the sample approaches the colloidal glass transition. This is telling us something about the nature of what a glass transition is, how it gets stiffer and stiffer, slower and slower, because of the larger and larger length scales of these relaxation motions. Uh, we can do other things. We can take these same particles and we can put them inside of cells. We do that because then we use the particles, the motion of the particles, to understand something about the nature of the cells. So here's an example where we track, again, the motion of the particles. It has a very similar appearance to what we saw before for the particles in water, but in fact, these are in cells. And we have been studying this and learning a completely new information about the nature of cells, what we find that shorter time scales, we're seeing the elastic nature of the internal part of the cells. At longer time scales, we're actually seeing the fact that the cell is filled with molecular motors, and the random nature of the molecular motors are buffeting the particles. It makes them look like they're diffusing, makes them look like they're in a fluid, but it's not a fluid-like at all, but rather it's due to the random nature of the molecular motors. This gives us a way of studying uh, the type of molecular motors inside of the cells. We're interested, in fact, in how the cells move <clears throat> due to these molecular motors and other things, but we tend to look at them not as single cells, but how they ultimately uh, uh, conspire to become a tissue. So as we, as we grow the cells into a confluent layer, we look at the motion of all the cells together. We, in fact, measure both the motion of the cells and the forces that the cells exert on the substrate, and that allows us to tell how the cells communicate with each other through uh, deformation of the environment in which they are. And we look at these things, and you can see these large swirling areas. Whoops, we actually calculate the length scale over which you see this large swirling, this correlation. And you can see that there's a large length scale over many, many cells. So there's a communication of, this, of the cells. When one cell is moving, a, a cell 
10 cells away, 20 cells away, knows that that cell is moving and responds in some way to that motion. And you can see we can look at the correlation both of the motion of the cells and the forces that the cells exert on their uh, neighbors. Another material we study is this uh, foam on the top of beer. I show this because this is certainly something I look forward to at the end of the session. Uh, this is what it looks like in a microscope. It's uh, small bubbles surrounded by a fluid. Um, here's another example of a, of a foam. This is shaving cream, something that I know a lot about but I don't actually use very often. Um, uh, what it is, what's interesting about this is it's really just bubbles of gas in a fluid. So you take gas and fluid and you mix them together and you end up with a solid. And so we spent many years trying to understand the nature of the fact that it's a solid mixing a gas and a fluid. You can do the same thing with two fluids. This is called an emulsion, where you mix one fluid and the miscible second fluid, you mix them together. If you mix them at the right concentrations, you get a solid. Think of mayonnaise or think of aioli, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a little while. Um, looking at these emulsions, fluids, mixture of fluids inside of other fluids, we uh, looked at what happens if we use liquid crystals. Liquid crystals are the same things that are often used in, in the display and all the monitors on the TV. They have both liquid and crystalline properties. And when we put drops of one uh, fluid, this in, case, in this case of water, inside a, a larger drop of a liquid crystal, we see large interactions between the water mediated by the fact that they're in this liquid crystalline kind of material. Well, everything that we study for years, we're looking at bulk emulsions, bulk foams. That's many, many uh, bubbles, many, many drops uh, together. And so it was a real revolution for us when we learned about microfluidics. Microfluidics are a way of controlling the fluids to make the drops, to make an emulsion drop by drop by drop. Here's an example where we're making uh, an emulsion, a drop of one fluid and a second fluid. Here we're making something like a thousand drops per second, and each drop is a, a few microns in diameter. It has a picoliter inside it. That's 10 to the minus 12 of a liter, a very, very small amount. We've learned how to control them. You can see we can make very uniform drops. We can collect them. We can break the drops, break them into two. We can break them evenly. We can break them into small bits. We can break them many, many times. All these are movies that you're seeing through a microscope slowed down because I'm doing thousands and thousands of drops per second. I'm showing movies that are slowed down so they're much slower. We can also use the drops as small reactors. Here we have something that's uh, two different colors and we have uh, all the drops are, are going up here. This is sort of the waste channel. But what we're going to do is use this as uh, the, each of the, uh, of the drops as a picoliter reactor vessel. So we can do chemical reaction in each reactor vessel. If we want to do that, we have to be able to sort these so we can choose them. Now we've turned on our sorting mach machinery and you can see all the clear drops come here, all the black drops go to the top. We can sort at thousands per second. We can do other things. We can inject. This is what we call a pico injector. We're literally injecting picoliters of one fluid into these small picoliter drops of another. And we use these actually as chemical reactor vessels. Uh, and we do with that, we can do all kinds of uh, uh, new uh, types of screening, high throughput screening. So, for example, we can make some, we've made some very fundamental studies of evolution of molecules using what's called directed evolution where we can sort libraries as large as 10 to the 8th. Typically, the way you, one does this now, you might be, if you're re very lucky, you can sort a library about 10 to the 3, about 1,000. Here we can do, in very, very easily, we can do libraries of 10 million or 100 million. Uh, this, of course, has tremendous applications for biotechnology, and people from my group have followed this up. They've started a company that uh, does genomic selection, Digital PCR, another company that's uh, trying to do a uh, very rapid and very inexpensive sequencing for diagnostic purposes. And I see this as a way, really, it's a wonderful opportunity for students and postdocs in the lab. They go, they work this, it gives uh, jobs, uh, high tech jobs, and many of my students and postdocs now work in these companies. I see this as an important um, uh, thing for me to do uh, to give back to society, to create jobs for society when there's opportunities for this. 
Uh, the uh, microfluidics also allows us to do other kinds of uh, studies. I showed you how we can make drops of one fluid in a second. Well, with this very simple device held together with our favorite material in my lab, uh, we can make more complicated structures. Here we're making drops inside of drops, or multiple emulsions. You see how there's one drop inside of another drop. Um, this is a more sophisticated uh, geometry that we use. Here we're making one set of drops, and we're flowing these drops and making them into a second set of drops. And with this, we can have tremendous control over the drops. So now we can dial in. We can make drops inside of drops. We can dial in both the number of drops and the size of the drops. You want five drops. You want different size. You tell us. We can make them. In fact, what's interesting, well, we can make them with different materials as well. What's interesting about this is we don't have to stop at two. So here we have one, two, three, and we can make drops inside of drops inside of drops. Of course, this looks like an academic exercise, but what's interesting is you can actually do something with this. Here's a structure that we made where this is an emulsion. This is water drops inside of oil, all inside of another oil, but it's surrounded by a hydrogel. This hydrogel is uh, thermosensitive. It shrinks when you heat it up. And so here, I'll play a movie. I'm heating it up. It's expelling the water. It's trying to compress. It can't compress, so it tears itself apart, and it releases whatever is inside it. So this is a really a very good way of having a, a controlled encapsulation and release structure. And in fact, one of the postdocs in my lab went to work at a, a cosmetics company. He got interested, and he'd, he'd done some development in my lab, and he actually tried to uh, uh, commercialize some of the things from my lab uh, and it uh, led to the starting of a small company that's now uh, in both uh, situated in, in France because that's where you have to be situated if you're selling to the cosmetics industry. They're uh, successfully selling to the cosmetics industry, but they're also uh, making larger scale structures. This is uh, one of the, my former students who works for the company developed this way of making larger scale structures, and this is a way of making caviar. So this is not real caviar, but this is really manufactured with the same technology that we were using. In fact, if you think about food, that leads to another type of uh, realization that many kinds of food are soft materials. In fact, if you look up the word spherification, you'll see it's something to do with gelation, but it will also immediately lead you to this person, Ferran Adria, who turns out to be one of the uh, world famous chefs. And this is the, 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 where the teaching aspect comes for, for, what we, for, for soft matter. He visited Harvard and he gave a talk on cooking and science. And that turned out to be a very spectacular success. I know nothing about cooking, by the way. I know how to eat, but I don't know how to cook. Um, uh, but I learned that he's a, a very, very popular uh, uh, chef. And this led to the establishment of a course. Uh, that's, it's a course on science and cooking. Um, it's really a science class. It's motivated by cooking. Um, but it's still real science. And it was taught by myself and my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Michael Brenner, as well as a talented team of teaching fellows, postdocs, who really do know something about cooking, unlike Michael and I. And this turned out to be a great success. Um, it made, uh, it was uh, widely, widely popular. Uh, the New York Times paid much more attention to this than to any of the science that we ever do. Um, and I'll show you a few movies of what happened. If, uh, hopefully the sound will play. This is the first class. <laughs> you can see all the kids are lining up to get in. And poor Let's Michael. To, uh, so again, I mean, so I repeat, there are some seats. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what you're supposed to do in a situation like this. Um, but I just point out that there are some seats a little bit further. If some of you could move up, more people will get in. There were 350 seats in this room. We had 650 people try to squeeze in. 700 students signed up. We have only 6,400 students in the university. 700 students signed up to take a physics class. How often have you take, taught a physics class where 700 students sign up to take it? This is what they were interested in, of course. Because it's something different, and it's something that's like common, like cooking and stuff like that. It's like something fun, but it's related to something that's usually possibly boring, like physics. We had a lab. This is what the lab looks like, uh, you know, cutting boards, shavers, funnels. And this lab was, was very popular. 
Um, I think the fact that you can eat your lab is pretty much the coolest thing ever. And in fact, we could eat the lab. We had a recipe of the week. This is the molten chocolate cake. As you cook it for different amounts of time, it cooks as you go in, and you can see how much is molten and how much is cooked. We had the students measure that as part of the lab. We had an equation of the week. They fit the data to this. We actually taught them real science. And in fact, we, we could establish new traditions. So one, we, we had 12 chefs, 12 world-class chefs, each give a lecture, and then we would give a lecture about the science. So here's one of them. Remember I told you something about supercooled fluids? In liquid state. Pro this is supercooled water. Sobre el meló congelat. And he pours it onto his dessert, and it freezes as soon as it pours. Això ho fem a la taula, fa el cambré a la taula. The class was amazed. You see this water and it, pour, and it pours. And so, of course, we, had, we could establish new traditions. So the new tradition was you clap when you see a nice dessert. But remember, I said we have an equation of the week. Here's Michael presenting the first equation of the That's week. That's our equation of the week. You're all supposed to clap. So you clap when you see an equation. How often, how often have you had undergraduate non-science majors clap when you see an equation? That was the fun of the course. Okay, I can't possibly thank all the people that I've worked with over the years and uh, done some of this, so this is just a picture of some of the groups of our collaborators taken uh, about a year and a half ago. And with that, I thank you for your attention.